In the episode Absolute Candor of Star Trek Picard, Picard runs into a former Romulan senator who confronts Picard for abandoning his effort to relocate and save Romulan citizens. Now, this scene is meant to highlight and criticize Picard's giving up the fight, but this Romulan senator isn't necessarily upset that Picard didn't save more lives. If I may be cynical here, he was a Romulan senator, who it's often shown in Star Trek didn't much care for everyday Romulan citizens. Indeed, this man survived and benefited first from Picard's efforts, most likely due to his higher status in Romulan society. But he's still hurt here, and the reason why is illuminated in one of his lines. You and Starfleet had no understanding of Romulan ingenuity, resolve, self-sufficiency. You took advantage of us at the very moment where we doubted ourselves, enticed us with your empty promises, and did everything in your power to scatter, confuse, and divide us. You see, this man feels shame. He feels shame that he and his fellow Romulans had to ask for help. And even when they humbled themselves enough to ask, they were left, abandoned on a planet that fell further and further into poverty with no recourse for them to escape, despite the Federation itself being a post-scarcity society, a society of plenty. This man carries his shame with him for his poverty, feeling on some level that it was his own fault for asking for help, and upset that those in power did, and still do, nothing to help him. been following my channel the past few weeks, many of you may already know that I lost my full-time job at the end of April due to many different factors, but most predominantly the current COVID-19 pandemic that has swept the globe and hit the United States particularly hard for many reasons, not the least of which are Ferengi-ish in origin. Now, unlike other countries in the world, like Canada, which is giving its citizens $2,000 per month in economic relief, at the time of this recording, the only major recourse that United States citizens like myself have been given if they lose their jobs is to apply for unemployment benefits. For those of you who don't know or aren't in the United States, unemployment benefits and insurance temporarily replaces a portion, typically half, though it varies state by state, of wages for workers who have been laid off from their jobs, as long as they're looking and available for work. So great, it's not perfect, but the unemployment benefits were somewhere for me to turn after I lost my job. Well, guess what? As of writing this video, over 3 million Americans have applied for unemployment, with 6.6 .6 Americans filing in one week at the end of March. The previous one week high before all of this COVID-19 pandemic was just 696,000 in October 1982. This dramatic increase in unemployment claims has led to an incredible strain on the unemployment system, leading to long physical lines, which are great during a pandemic by the way, backed up phone lines and overlooked computer systems, many of which haven't been updated in over 40 years, running on an old coding system like COBOL, which no one uses anymore. So what does all that insanity mean for me on an individual level? Well, I'm going to show you. I'm going to do what I've been doing every morning for the past week since I lost my job. You see, because I worked outside of California, the state in which I reside in within the past 18 months, I'm not able to apply online using California's online system. I have to call into California's system. And here's what happens every single time. All right, so I'm just gonna call the unemployment line in California. Should be fun. So let's just see, put it on speaker. Thank you for calling the Employment Development Department Unemployment Insurance Customer Service Center. We are currently receiving more calls than we have capacity to answer. The following is an informational message. At the end of the message, the phone will hang up. To better serve you, we have established a new unemployment insurance online assistance center with expand. That was one call. I have called the California Unemployment Office an average of 500 times a day during the past week. Calling, getting hung up on, and then immediately calling again. Sometimes, every once in a while, I actually get into the system and actually get to a main menu, and I have to spend about five minutes navigating that whole menu system to finally get placed in a line so that I'll be able to talk to the next operator. 
only to immediately, as soon as I'm told I'll be able to speak to the next operator, haha, lol, we're actually gonna hang up onto you again, so just restart the whole process. And so I restart the whole process again, calling again, calling again, sometimes getting onto the main menu system, going through the whole main menu, hoping that I finally won't be dropped this time, and then unceremoniously being dropped yet again. This has been my life trying desperately to get onto a system that, as the nice computer man's voice said, is supposed to be there for me during this hard economic time. But here's the thing. While certainly exacerbated right now, this inability to easily get on unemployment isn't a bug highlighted by COVID-19, but it's a feature of the entire United States system. In the Star Trek Deep Space Nine episode, The Magnificent Ferengi, Thalos Six was a planet where vagrancy was a crime. The prescribed penalty for vagrancy was a fine, and if one could not pay it, it was imprisonment for you until you could. In that episode, Quart's cousin Gala was arrested on Thalos Six for vagrancy and was jailed at a Starbase brig, unable to pay his fine until Quark helped him out. How the mighty have fallen. Cousin Quark. I heard you were arrested on Telos 6 for vagrancy. Causing Gala to feel great shame at not being able to pay his own bills in a Ferengi society that only values those who have money. You see, in that episode of Deep Space Nine, those who are vagrant, homeless, they're typically poor. So the poor get arrested, and the only way out of prison is to pay a fine, a fine which they can't pay because they're poor. They're trapped there. This is how many systems in the United States operate, trapping you in an endless cycle of poverty. Because we were talking about it, let's start with unemployment benefits. You see, unemployment is meant to be a bureaucratic nightmare. It's meant to be hard to get onto. In Florida, Republicans have admitted that their unemployment system is failing because it was designed that way. Speaking about the former governor and now senator for Florida, Rick Scott, one government advisor in Florida stated, quote, it's a shit sandwich and it was designed that way by Scott. It wasn't about saving money, it was about making it harder for people to get benefits or keep benefits so that the unemployment numbers were low to give the governor something to brag about. The new system, which was started in 2013 under Rick Scott, was designed to limit benefits going out so as to lower unemployment taxes paid by businesses. Right now in Florida during the COVID-19 pandemic, nearly 400,000 people were actually able to file claims at the time of this recording. Only 400,000, when an estimated 1 million people are unemployed in that state. So that's less than half. Oh, and by the way, only 10 to 15% of those 400,000 claims have been even processed, meaning that most of the people who have even gotten a claim through still aren't getting any money to help them during this pandemic. Now, keep in mind, I'm running this video two weeks in advance of it being posted, so these numbers have probably changed since I talked about it in front of the camera, but I would wager a guess that it hasn't changed really all for the better. Arkansas, another state in the United States, did something similar, changing requirements for things like Medicaid and unemployment benefits, knowing that by changing the rules, it would cause people to not be able to meet documentation requirements and thus lose their benefits. And this was the point. It wasn't the point to help people, it wasn't to make it easier to get on the system, it was to help less people so that corporations could save money in the long run. Even in my own California, which is better than most states when it comes to unemployment, its unemployment phone lines are only open four hours a day. Four hours a day. Still, like right now, it's weeks into this crisis, this pandemic across the country, and I can still only call the unemployment line between 8 a.m. and noon, Monday to Friday. Four hours a day. And California is one of the biggest states in the United States. And with a near 20% unemployment rate, that's potentially up to 7 million people trying to call a phone line that is only open four hours a day, five days a week. Oh, and speaking of which, sorry, it's been a little bit too long since I made a call, so let me, let me make another unemployment call real quick. Thank you for calling the Employment Development Department Unemployment Insurance Customer Service Center. We are currently receiving more calls than we have capacity to answer. The following is an informational message. At the end of the message, the phone will hang up. To better serve you, we have established a new unemployment insurance. You know, after hearing that robot man's voice well over a thousand times now, I, I gotta say, I do wonder how he's doing during all this. He's honestly become like a like a friend to me, and his voice does uh, kind of sound 
kind of sexy. I mean, he does have that like robot, like neutral voice. Oh boy, I've been self-isolating for too long. I need some umoxing, if you know what I mean. To distract from uh, certain other frustrations going on in my life right now, these policies are designed to keep people off of these systems, to keep people in poverty, even if they do get on them. Remember how I said earlier how unemployment works? That it's based on your income? You see, you get a certain amount of money based on how much you were making before you became unemployed. So if you were making a lot of money, you'll be making an okay amount in unemployment. But if you didn't make a lot of money before you lost your job, then you'll make a hell of a lot less. This leads to things like a woman in Iowa only making $6 for her unemployment claims, despite having two kids. She makes $6. Now, she's hoping that the CARE Act, which will provide an extra $600 per week for those on unemployment, will help her, though as of this writing and filming, those benefits haven't even started coming yet. And there have been at least two months of rent due since this pandemic hit the United States. So I hope she still has a home by that point when these 600 extra dollars a week are gonna come in. And this is all hoping that you qualify for benefits in the first place. Cause if you make less than $5,000, you probably don't. So if you make less money, you're not even gonna get unemployment to begin with. And unemployment isn't the only system in the United States built to keep those in poverty in poverty. For example, housing policies and zoning laws cause rent to increase, pushing those in poverty out of areas with better jobs and education. Two things that could actually help them out of poverty. Actually, you know what? Let me, let me quick tell you a story about my life, something that happened to me. Back when I first moved to Los Angeles, I lived in a more lower income area of the city, and honestly, I still do. But one day, uh, I got pulled over by the police one night about a block from my house at 2 a.m. because I did a rolling stop on a red light. Now, never mind that there were no cars on the road, but whatever, I did technically break the law by doing a rolling stop. I, I get it, so I got a ticket. And that ticket for the rolling stop at 2 a.m. was $450. In more affluent areas of the United States, a ticket for a rolling stop typically only costs around $80. So, of course, I tried to contest that ticket just to see if I could get out of paying $450 for a rolling stop at 2 a.m. Turns out, in California, to contest a ticket, you need to pay the money up front. Only then can you go in front of a judge to contest the ticket. And only if you win do you get your money back. And even if you do win and you do get your money back, it will still take about six months for you to get your $450. This is unlike most states, which allow you to contest the ticket first or go in front of a judge, and then if you lose, only then do you have to pay the money. Speaking of which, to go in front of the judge, court happens midday during a work week. So imagine if I barely had $450 to spend and I needed that $450 to pay for my rent that month. So in order to contest the ticket, which is my legal right, by the way, I needed to risk my financial well-being and ability to pay my rent and take a day off of work, potentially losing money. Now, thankfully for me, I had money and I had a salary job at the time, but most people who lived in the area that I did, did not. So if you're in that situation, you either just pay the money or risk losing it anyways and a day's wages. So most people just pay the 450 and just try to survive. Again, these systems keep people in poverty because they have no other decisions, no other recourse, even when they have legal rights to do so. Sorry, I, I apologize, I, uh, I gotta make a call again. It's about that time. Thank you for calling the Employment Development Department Unemployment Insurance You're Customer welcome. Service Center. We are currently receiving more calls than we have capacity to answer. The following is an informational message. At That's how the United States system works. Those in poverty are meant to stay in poverty. But why is this an issue now? Why are we talking about it now? You see, it's not just because of COVID-19. It's because people like me were never meant to interact with this system, never meant to suffer under it. I come from a white upper middle class family. I was able to go to college and get a good education and I had a good paying job. Before COVID, only 5.3% of the population lived in poverty. Yet 25% of Native Americans were in poverty and 20% of black people and 18% of Hispanic people. The further away from poverty you are, the more indirectly it benefits you. 
Even if someone who does make a bunch of money does have to go on these systems, as I said before, you typically make more money out of them anyways, and it's typically easier for you to get onto them. Because again, you'll be able to go to an unemployment office in a part of the city that doesn't have as much unemployment, so the lines are much lower for you and you can talk to someone directly. But now, this pandemic has hit a much greater swath of America. People who were never meant to get hit have become unemployed. People who were never meant to be scared for their finances are scared for their finances. Which circles me back to something I spoke about all the way back at the beginning of this video. Remember that Romulan senator? Remember that humiliation and pain that we talked about him having? Feeling that he was ignored by a society of plenty, which hurt him extra hard because he had been once at the peak of society? He was a senator for heaven's sakes. He had dignity because he was upper class, higher class, a better class. That humiliation, that shame that he felt, that's what so many in poverty feel every single day. You see, in, especially in the United States, there's an assumption, a value judgment made against those who are in poverty, who need to use these systems just to pay their bills. American society is built around the idea that you must be useful, that you must work in order to be a worthwhile human being. That to need to ask for help from others, such as going through welfare systems like unemployment, that you're a parasite on our society, that your life is less than worthless, it's a drain. I spoke about in another one of my videos that in capitalism, the value of something is how much labor is spent on it. And labor is typically measured in time. So something is worth more if you spend more time working to make it. And that same value applies to people. That if your time is spent wasted on something else other than working, that's wasted time. Are too many Americans avoiding work to collect welfare? Subsidized freeloaders. We're going to a majority of takers versus makers. In those particular positions, I just don't want a poor person. Holly Richardson said it best in these powerful words. You see, the shame of being poor isn't just about having no money. It's about lacking a basic confidence in who you are and what you deserve. I've been calling the unemployment line for hours and hours. I've made about over 2,000 phone calls in about a week. That is how my time is being used right now. Trying so hard to desperately get help, to ask for help. And I can't tell you how shameful that makes me feel. That's how I've been told to view myself, that by asking for help, I'm lazy, I'm a waste. And I honestly, I feel less confident in myself. I feel like I don't deserve the help because I'm not working. And that feeling goes through my whole life. I feel this lack of confidence in every piece of my life going forward. When I try to write cover letters applying for jobs, I don't feel like hyping myself up. What's there to hype up? I, I, I don't feel that confidence that you kind of need to put forward in a cover letter. I don't feel like I'm, I'm going to be good enough to go up against all the other applicants applying. So many of you out there watching this video support me, both here on YouTube or on my Patreon. And in all honesty, I can't tell you how much your Patreon support means to me right now because <laughs> without unemployment right now, that's what's helping me pay the bills, my Patreon. But your support also scares me in a little way because truly and honestly, I feel like sometimes I don't deserve your goodwill or kindness or your faith in me as a creator. Now, that's a feeling that is true for pretty much any and every artist or creator who tries to make something from their heart, that what is in our heart isn't worth sharing. And I try to fight that feeling every single day, but it feels so much harder to fight that fight right now. I'm experiencing this, this shame right now, but that's not uncommon, this feeling for anyone who needs financial help, and especially for those in poverty. Society looks down on those in poverty, makes it hard for them to get on benefits, so they have to spend so much of their time just trying to get help, let alone trying to find work or get a job, which is even harder because they have less time and less confidence to do so. And we've been talking about systems that perpetuate poverty, like the big governmental things that hurt the little person. But think about all the small things, the, the glances, the disdain, the disgust that so many in America look at the poor with, people that you cross on the street or when you go into a store and see someone who looks like they don't make as much money, you kind of look down on them. Imagine feeling those looks every single day as you walk around. A study found that financial problems and shame are directly connected and feed off of each other. Those in poverty feel profound shame at being poor, at looking poor, so they try their best to look better off, to appear rich. They buy nicer clothing, fancy jewelry, or even fancy cars to show off that they're doing okay so people just don't shame them, so they can have some sense of self-worth. 
But these things are expensive, and they keep them in poverty. It's a cycle that just perpetuates itself, this, this shame cycle, and our disdain for the poor. Just so they, they can even have a modicum of comfort in their daily lives, they keep themselves in this cycle. And if they don't do that, well, those in poverty often have the biggest mental health crises, often stemming from the shame or stress of them being poor. They also have some of the highest suicide rates in all of the United States. Also, as COVID-19 has shown, those living in poverty are less likely to go to a hospital if they get sick because they don't wish to admit that they are sick. They don't want to look weak. This leads to those in poverty who feel shame to be more likely to die in a pandemic that we're currently in. So many people like myself are feeling this shame, this fear of asking for help, of, of needing to appear strong and confident because we got trapped in a system that uses that fear and shame to trap those at the bottom in an endless cycle of poverty. From the systems in place to keep them there, to the humiliation they feel if they have to ask someone to help, or for the scorn someone feels being visibly poor walking down the street. It's just that now, more of us than ever are feeling it. Many of us who weren't quote unquote meant to feel it by society. But this feeling has always existed. As I said before, this is a feature of the system. This is not a bug. The only bug in this system is that any of us that society actually values even actually saw it. So here I am just trying to be honest and, and share my feelings and the systems that I see in place, but also in a weird counterintuitive way, trying to make this productive by making this video. I'm still trying to, you know, take this, this fear and, and shame that I'm in and make it somewhat productive, you know, by making it something that other people can see and use and talk about. I can't just not work. I'm still trying to feel useful as I call and call and call and call. Thank you for calling the Employment Development Department, Unemployment Insurance Customer Service Center. We are currently receiving more calls than we have capacity. I joked about the man on the phone of the unemployment line, the robot voice being a friend. And in many ways, that's actually not a joke. His voice has become a weird constant in my life this week. It's become a weird, like, comforting thing, something that I can look forward to in the day. It's psychologically weird because I think it's just happening because I feel so alone in this right now. I feel alone in, in this fear and shame, but you know what? We're not alone. I'm not alone. This channel and my work always tries to look at the positive of a situation. That's what I want to do with the channel. I want to look positively at the world and our outlook. And I know that this is part of an element of my background and privilege that enables me to look at this situation with hope and optimism. Others don't always get the chance to feel this way when they're in this place that so many of us are in right now. But this positivity is what I can offer and I hope that I can at least share a bit of it. That's what Star Trek is about, as I always say. Knowing that things are bad now, but the future can be better that we can make it better if we just work together, if we believe in each other. And going back to that Romulan scene I mentioned at the beginning of this video, I think it's important to remember what that scene was trying to say. Don't be like Picard was. Someone who isolated himself, who gave up, who felt lonely, waiting to die because he felt useless. Instead, let's be like Picard throughout Star Trek Picard Season 1. Someone who fights for community, commonality, and connection. We have a lot of fights and battles ahead of us if we want to get to that better future in Star Trek. And I just outlined a couple of the battles. There are many, many more. But to get there, we must first believe in ourselves and believe in that better tomorrow. So know this. Right now, it's okay to be scared. But you are worthy. You are stronger than you think. And you are not alone. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope it was helpful for a lot of you. I, like I said, I just wanted to share a little bit of the fear and shame and, and, and just uncertainty that I'm feeling right now in this moment. I hope that all of you are able to connect with that. Um, the usual rigmarole, um, don't forget to subscribe to this channel, give it a thumbs up. Uh, let me know what you feel about this video down in the comments below. Um, it's a safe space and I will try to make sure it stays that way. So feel free to share whatever you want if you're comfortable. Also, like I said uh, elsewhere in the video, I did lose my full-time job. So if you are able to help me out over on Patreon, every little bit helps me directly pay the bills, especially as I'm trying to get on unemployment right now. So yeah, if you can help me over there, it really does mean a lot, but um, you know, as I always say, regardless if you subscribe or if you like or comment or give to my patron, I'm just glad that you stopped by and I hope that you, as always, live long and prosper.
Thank you all of you for watching and a special thank you to my patrons, including my amazing commander level and above patrons, Miranda Janelle, Ashley Allen, Eli Berg-Moss, Sela Roman, Christina Dalliance, Greg Gillum, Stefan Schuhart, Boyd and Mary Beth Earl, Ish the Mad, Randy Thompson, Mouse Pounder, Wellington Marcus, Lorena Mesa, Alexander Miller, Mari Neckar, Gavin Robinson, Michael Beam, Aaron Brown, Munir Amlani, Maggie Evans, Maeve, Wen Dizzle Bizzle, Dante St. James, Wayne Twitchell, Patrick Shannon, Din Hagney, Mystic the Monakeet, Bree Beecher, and Polly Mina. All of your support means so much to me right now, so thank you to all of you. Live long and prosper.